Welcome everyone. Um, yes, we are blocking the video for the participants as well as their microphones. Um, I'm, I, I apologize for that. For most of and pretty much all of our senior center events, we do allow the videos to be live and the microphones to be unmuted. Because of the particular nature of this presentation and that we expect uh, um, over 100, possibly up to 200 participants. The bandwidth issues, you'll, there's uh, the problems of, uh, of the, uh, the video breaking up. It's, it's better with the videos off. And it just simply the, the, the conversation with 100 plus people is really challenging. So we're, uh, we're sorry about that. I know that it, you're used to being able to, to see and be seen and hear and be heard. But for this one particular event, we're just going to uh, have you uh, see the presenters. Uh, and uh, as I say, at the, at the end, if you have not been able to ask a question because you have problems with the chat function, uh, we'll, we'll be following up with the uh, ways that you can, uh, can do that. Okay, we'll just wait a few more minutes as the last uh, people jumping off their last Zoom and jumping onto this one. <laughs> Get in. We have a question about how this recording will be shared. Um, we will be um, sharing it through a link on the email that will go out to each of you who signed up. Um, also, I believe we will be posting it on our Pasadena Senior Center website uh, that there may be a delay in doing that. Um, also, you, if you don't get an email from us in the next, I'd say the next two days regarding this, just check your spam folder because sometimes emails with links will just bypass, uh, bypass your inbox and go direct to spam. So just check for something coming from the Pasadena Senior Center. Uh, that or I'm Annie Lasky. It, it may show is coming from me. It may show is coming from Charmaine Nelson, who is our communications manager. Uh, so just watch out for that. Again, it will be in the next. Uh, won't won't be this afternoon because we'll have to upload the video, but uh, it it will be coming. So lots of questions already being asked. Okay, it is 11.02, so I am going to just officially start the program. So welcome everyone to the virtual Pasadena Senior Center. Uh, I am Annie Lasky, I'm the Director of Events. The Pasadena Senior Center is a donor-supported nonprofit organization that offers social services, physical fitness, and arts and culture programming to older adults. Today's COVID-19 vaccination information program is co-sponsored by Pasadena Village, an intentional community of older adults from the greater Pasadena area who have joined together to help each other navigate the challenges and opportunities of aging. Pasadena Village's Executive Director, Katie Brandon, is here with us today and will be moderating the Q&A with me following the presentation. Thank you, Katie. Uh, a little housekeeping before we begin. As we've been mentioning, due to the large number of people joining today's program, let's see, we're uh, up to 96 right now, uh, we will be keeping microphones muted as well as videos off. And we're taking questions for the Q&A portion only via the chat function. In case you're not familiar with using chat, if you move your cursor, cursor to the bottom of your screen, you should see a label, an, an icon labeled chat with like a little talking box. When you click on that icon, a box will come up for you to type your message in. To send the message, just press enter on your keypad. Today's program is scheduled for one hour and it may not be possible to get in everyone's questions. They've already been coming in fast and furious. I know everyone has lots of questions. COVID vaccination is a big topic and we apologize in advance to those whose specific questions were not addressed and also to those who have trouble using the chat function. The Senior Center will be sending a follow-up email to everyone who registered for this talk, which will have phone numbers and links for you to contact for further information. We will also be posting a video of this talk that you can go back to for reference. That will be, uh, again, emailed to everybody, uh, the link as well as I uh, expect it will be posted on our website. 
Now on to the presentation. Our guests today are Dr. Kimberly Schreiner of Huntington Hospital and Judith Dunaway of the Pasadena Department of Health. Their presentations will be followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A. To start off, Dr. Kimberly Schreiner is an infectious disease and tropical medical specialist. Since 1992, she has taught as a faculty member at Huntington Hospital. Beyond her invaluable leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Schreiner is the founder and director of Huntington's Phil Simon Clinic, which provides complete HIV and infectious disease care for the underserved in the St. Gabriel Valley. In 2001, she founded the Phil Simon Clinic Tanzania Project, a nonprofit global outreach program in East Africa. Please welcome Dr. Kimberly Schreiner and I will unspotlight the rest of us and leave it just to Dr. Kimberly. Thank you very much, Annie. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get the slide presentation going here. Can everybody see that? We're good? We're good. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this relatively quickly. I hope that I, I'm able to answer some of your questions during the talk, but I wanna leave uh, plenty of time for Judith who really has the more important part of this uh, presentation in terms of how to get the vaccines. So uh, this is a challenging time. We are in the middle of an historic pandemic. And uh, this is certainly something not uh, unknown to uh, human civilization. Pandemics have been occurring since uh, we first stood up and looked across the Serengeti Plains there. Uh, but there's been some very famous pandemics in the literature. Thucydides described the plague of Athens. Uh, Galen described the plague of Rome. Those were uh, probably both smallpox. Of course, the Black Death, which occurred through most of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance in Europe, uh, was in a very important pandemic. In our own, uh, within the last 150 years, of course, we had the 1918 H1N1 Spanish flu pandemic, uh, which uh, infected about one fifth of the planet's population and killed over 50 million people. Uh, in 1981, the HIV pandemic started. And of course, the HIV pandemic is continuing on to this very day. Um, it's a different type of pandemic, but uh, it is certainly a very significant one throughout history. Uh, in 2003, we had the first taste of a coronavirus pandemic with the emergence of SARS-1 and the Middle Eastern respiratory virus. And then, of course, in 2014, we had a reasonably large outbreak of uh, Ebola hemorrhagic fever in Western Africa. And just as a personal note, uh, this is a picture that was taken by my grandmother in San Francisco during the 1918 pandemic. And I think what the message here is wearing your mask, it might save your life, is certainly true uh, for what we're dealing with uh, today. So on December 31st, China alerted WHO about several cases of an unusual pneumonia. And in January of 2020, a previously healthy 54-year-old woman died of a mysterious pneumonia in San, San Jose, California. This was SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. It's a beta coronavirus that came from animals. Prior to December of 2019, no one on the planet had any immunity to this disease. Uh, it's caused the COVID pandemic. It is a highly transmissible and very infectious human to human pathogen. Uh, it is very dangerous and caused millions of people to become very sick and many to die. There are very limited medications to treat it and it is certainly uh, not a hoax. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 event was what we call a zoonotic spillover event. This virus came from bats whether it uh, was transmitted in the Wuhan wet market, we don't know, uh, but animal viruses that spill over into humans often become more virulent, nastier, and they can cause very severe disease. Um, and so often these also uh, involve an intermediate animal. And with this particular virus, it seems that the pangolin, which is this unusual little uh, armadillo type creature, uh, may have been uh, a part of the cycle of SARS-CoV-2 infecting humans because that animal is sold in um, wet markets. So here we are today. This is the st statistics from this morning, really horrendous statistics. We have 105 million cases of SARS-CoV-2 of COVID-19 throughout the world. The United States has really experienced a large bulk of this disease. We comprise 4% of the planet's population, but we account for greater than 20% of the deaths due to COVID-19. And in LA County, we've had a particularly large surge in the last month that really has impacted our healthcare facilities and our society. And so all of us are very familiar now with these images. It's only been a year, actually a little bit less than a year that this has been going on in the, in the United States or at least recognized in the United States. And yet we're all very familiar with these images now, which are pretty horrific. 
We have in that time, however, learned a lot about this pathogen. We know that it's a highly infectious pathogen, that it's transmitted through not only mucosal respiratory droplets, but it also can be aerosolized. Very tiny particles can be suspended in the air. It can be transmitted by people who don't have symptoms, uh, and it is highly infectious. It also is a very aggressive virus. These are the spike proteins that are expressed on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Uh, this is the attachment site of the virus to the, excuse me, to the human um, uh, cells. Uh, and it's a very, very aggressive virus that once it gets in, it, it causes all kinds of problems. It doesn't just infect the lungs. It infects many different parts of the body, including the heart, the brain, uh, the kidneys, the liver. It uh, interferes with your inf inflammation and immune system. Uh, and it has a very high mortality. Uh, and so it's an extremely dangerous virus. We also know, as do so many infectious diseases, that it is a disease of inequity. In other words, it has disproportionately affected people of color and people, people in lower socioeconomic uh, regions and uh, uh, echelons. And so it's very important that as we move forward developing vaccines, uh, that we make sure we reach out to those populations and try to get them protected. We do know, however, that we can protect ourselves with pretty simple methods, uh, and that's called mitigation. We certainly know that wearing a mask is a very important part of preventing spread. It not only uh, protects you from acquiring COVID-19, but it protects others from you and your respiratory droplets as well. And so mask wearing will continue to be something we're going to do for the many, many months, if not years, as we move out of the pandemic. It's going to be a very important part working in tandem with the vaccines to try to get this pandemic under control. I think most people are sort of sick of the term social distancing. We are social creatures and we want to be together. We want to hug our families and our, our friends and go out to dinner and have a good time. But right now this virus doesn't care if it's your relative or it's your good friend or it's your colleague. It just wants to go to a non-immune host. And so that's why we really recommend that for the time being until the, most of the country is vaccinated, you really observe uh, pretty good social distancing and avoid crowds. Washing your hands is always a good idea. Uh, contact transmission is not that common a method of transmission, but it can occur, so it's very important that you, uh, that you do that. So how are we gonna get out of this mess? Well, I really think that, and most of us believe that the only way out are going to be vaccines. And I wanna talk about uh, that, that modality uh, today and to try to reassure you that although these vaccines have been developed at an incredible speed, it is remarkable. We're very lucky to live in 2021 uh, because uh, we have access to something that can protect us much quicker than what happened in 1918. But because of the speed with which these vaccines are coming out, I think many people are afraid uh, that they've been developed too quickly. Taking the moniker of uh, Project uh, Warp Speed maybe wasn't the best choice either, although it did express the urgency for the development of vaccine. But I wanna reassure you that the truth is these vaccines have been uh, the platform for these vaccines is actually quite well established. In January of uh, uh, 2020, the Chinese government released the genomic sequence for SARS-CoV-2. That's the recipe for this virus. And that was a very important thing to have done. It was just placed on the internet, we had access around the world. Uh, and this is the code right here. This is the recipe for the spike protein. So that's the, probably the most important part of that information. On January 11th, the very next day, Dr. Barney Graham, who's at the National Institutes of Health, a colleague of Dr. Fauci, uh, started designing a modified protein that could be used for a vaccine. It was recognized extremely early during this pandemic, just last year, that a vaccine was going to be a very important part of getting this thing under control. The next day after that, Dr. Graham delivered that information to Moderna, which is, um, it was a small uh, pharmaceutical company that was interested in mRNA platforms and they got the information very quickly and started working on developing a vaccine. Well, what is a vaccine? A vaccine is an injection or a substance that when introduced into your body, stimulates your immune system to create protective molecules, we call those neutralizing antibodies, and cells, a cellular immune response to prevent you from acquiring or getting sick uh, from an infectious disease. You notice I say here, prevent you from acquiring or getting sick from an infectious disease, not so much about spreading the infectious disease. And we'll come back to that in a bit. What do vaccines do? Well, they can protect an individual from an infectious disease. They can protect a community from the spread of an infectious disease. Uh, and occasionally vaccines are used to treat an infectious disease. That's true for the Ebola vaccine. That's not only protects individuals, but it can be done uh, in people that uh, already have the disease. So vaccine technology or vaccine theory has been around actually since the ancient uh, Chinese developed some very early 
uh, vaccine programs, uh, recognizing that if you inoculated people with some uh, material from people with uh, wounds, that you might protect them from smallpox. Nobody knew what smallpox was in those days. And neither did um, Edward Jenner really know very much about what the virus was, but he did recognize that uh, cow uh, milkmaids in England didn't seem to get smallpox, which of course has been a very important plague and pandemic throughout the history of human civilization. And he noticed that these ladies didn't get smallpox. And the reason that they didn't is because when they milked the cows on the udders of the cows were small ulcers from a similar virus called cowpox. And so they were inoculated a little bit, if you will, um, with uh, small amounts of the virus and that protected them from smallpox. So Jenner did a very important experiment um, on the eight-year-old son of his gardener, whose name was James Phipps. He took some scrapings from the wound off of a cow's udder with cowpox and scratched it into James Phipps' arm. James Phipps never developed smallpox. And in fact, he did that with several other people uh, and noticed that they, they also did not develop smallpox. So this was the beginning of the theory of vaccination. What are the requirements for a successful vaccine? We, we want it to be safe, well-studied. We want it directed specifically toward the virus or bacteria that we're looking at. We want to make sure that it, it stimulates a very strong and lasting immunity in all age groups and all risk groups, regardless of ethnicity, age, and comorbidities. It should be well accepted by the public. You have to be able to produce it in large quantities. It should be easily transportable and storage, and storage parameters should be fairly uh, acceptable and it should have limited side effects. How can you administer a vaccine? The large, vast majority of vaccines, certainly the ones that are available for COVID-19 are intramuscular, but you can give vaccines under the skin, that's called subcutaneous. There are some inhaled vaccines, influenza has an inhaled vaccine. Oral vaccines are very familiar to those of us who received the oral polio vaccine. It's a great oral vaccine for typhoid fever. And there's some interesting new technologies, these micro needle administration platforms where it's a little piece of plastic that's attached to your arm and it sort of uh, seeps the um, uh, medication into your arm. So for this particular pandemic, I'm not a big fan of uh, animal uh, research, but this one was is a once in a lifetime uh, pandemic with a pathogen that has a very high morbidity and mortality in humans. And so I think a limited study was very important to try to establish proof of concept of a vaccine. This was a study that was done earlier this year in rhesus macaque monkeys. They get COVID-19, uh, unlike many other animals, uh, and 35 of them were um, were used. Half of them received real vaccine. Some of them received uh, half of them received a placebo vaccine. And basically, what this study showed was that six weeks after vaccination, the animals that had received the real vaccine um, had a very uh, robust uh, cellular and antibody response to the vaccine itself. And indeed, when they were challenged with the virus, when they were rechallenged with SARS-CoV-2 they were able to mount an adequate immune response that protected them from getting sick. So that was the proof of concept. This was taken then into the pharmaceutical companies that were at this time about five or six of them simultaneously beginning to look at vaccine development and they did what are called phase one, two, and three trials. And this is a very important part of studying medications or vaccines. Phase one and two are largely looking at effectiveness of different doses and the safety. Phase three is the large trial where you're really looking at whether this vaccine or medication is going to protect the people that are in the trial. And so what they did is they took uh, large numbers of healthy people and half of them received placebo and half of them received a COVID-19 vaccine. And I'll show you the data for that in a second. The thing to remember is that often vaccine trials and medication trials take five, six, seven years to do because usually they're, they're directed towards diseases that aren't very common in the general population. Well, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so there's lots of COVID-19 out there. And that's another reason why uh, the pharmaceutical companies were able to collect the data quickly and get to the uh, desired endpoints very quickly. Um, all of the vaccines that are being developed right now are directed towards the spike protein, which is the most important protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus that allows its attachment to the uh, human host. There are many different types of vaccine uh, varieties that are going on. I'm gonna focus on these two because these are the ones that are currently available, the nucleotide vaccines or mRNA vaccines, and then the viral vector vaccines. And I'll tell you what the difference is in a second. Uh, these are just the, the sort of four different types of vaccines that um, are used for many different types of diseases. Uh, mRNA technology is not new, and I will tell you about that in a second, uh, but it is going to be a very important a part of our vaccine um, armamentarium, if you will, um, uh, as we move forward. And it certainly is an important part for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Uh, so these are just the different types of vaccines and um, 
if you're interested, we can go into the details about that during the question and answer study. These are currently the vaccines that are deployed or near deployment. Of course, in the United States, we now have emergency use authorization or EUA for the Pfizer vaccine, which is an mRNA vaccine, and for the Moderna vaccine, which is also an mRNA vaccine. Within the next few weeks, I think it's very likely that we're going to receive EUA certification for the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. That is an adenovirus vector where an adenovirus and another type of virus is used to uh, carry in the genetic information for the virus against SARS-CoV-2. That's a very traditional type of platform for vaccine development. And that also is the same similar platform to the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is also certainly being used widely in Europe right now. It's probably going to come into the United States within a few weeks. Uh, my understanding is that the US just bought 100 million doses of the AstraZeneca uh, Oxford vaccine. Now you'll notice I put the efficacy up there. That means the effectiveness of the vaccines. Uh, one of the things that's been just astounding is that uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines uh, proved to be very, very uh, effective, 95%. And I'll show you the data on that in a minute. Um, we were expecting 60 to 70%. That's really quite good enough for a vaccine. That's what the influenza vaccine is. That's what a lot of even really good vaccines like measles uh, tend to be sort of around 75, 80%. So to achieve 95% was fantastic. Does that mean that those vaccines are better than the AstraZeneca vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or the Novavax vaccine? No, all these vaccines are very, very effective. And so whatever vaccine you have access to and, uh, and uh, perhaps the quickest that you can have access to, that's the one you should get. There's no statistical difference in terms of the efficacy of these vaccines. And so unfortunately, these vaccines have set a, set a very high bar and I think it's gonna be a little bit hard to convince people that these other vaccines are just as good and have some advantages perhaps over the mRNA vaccines. I put on the Sinovac vaccine. That was a vaccine that was developed very early with the Chinese. Uh, its efficacy is pretty low. They've been struggling with that vaccine. Um, the Sputnik V, which we had really pretty questionable phase three data, seems actually to be quite safe and effective. This is a preprint article that just came out in the Lancet uh, this week. So we'll keep an eye on that. So I wanna focus on mRNA vaccines because that's what's available right now. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, these, this is relatively old technology. And what's really interesting is a lot of the vaccines that are being developed have had very prominent female scientists contribute to the development of these vaccines. And perhaps the most prominent is Catalin Carrico, uh, who uh, is the person uh, 20 years ago, basically uh, sort of overcame a lot of the, the complications associated with introducing little bits of genetic material into human cells to stimulate those cells to make appropriate antibodies or uh, perhaps to fight off cancer. mRNA technology can be used for many things besides vaccines. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine, and Dr. Carrico now works with the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, Dr. Kizmekia Corbett works with the Moderna vaccine. She's in Dr. Fauci's lab and also a very prominent uh, uh, physician, uh, science, research scientist who's now helped bring forth the Moderna vaccine. So this is a Schreiner cartoon on this, a very simple version of how an mRNA vaccine works. Here's SARS-CoV-2 with its spike proteins on the surface. This is what the virus looks like. So with an mRNA vaccine, what you do is the scientists remove a little piece of spike protein and they have the recipe for that. Remember the genome sequence that was released to Dr. Graham very early in the pandemic. This is the recipe. It's, that isn't the actual real recipe, but for all intents and purposes, that's what it is. Dr. Carrico uh, knew that we needed to add this little fatty envelope around that a bit of genetic material to um, protect it as it entered the human cell. Then that is injected into, into the human body and that information is sent into a human cell. And what it does, it doesn't go into your own genetic material. It stays out here in what's called the cytoplasm in the out, outside part of the cell. And it tells the cell to make that protein. So the cell starts making that protein and that protein then goes out into your body and meanwhile, your immune system, your B cells and your T cells are going, wait a minute here, something's coming along here that I don't recognize. What the heck is this thing? And so these cells start making what are called antibodies. Those are molecules that can go in and attach to the foreign uh, object and get rid of it. So along comes another real SARS-CoV-2 virus, okay? Um, you get exposed to COVID-19. Now your immune system has been trained to recognize that spike protein to make antibodies to it and to get rid of it. And there you go. And that's what an mRNA vaccine does. So the material is this little snippet of genetic material, doesn't go into your own genetic material, doesn't really have any activity in and of itself. 
but it teaches your body how to make uh, how to react and respond to the most important part of the protein uh, of the virus SARS-CoV-2. The advantages are they're very safe. There's no risk of infection itself or what we call insertion of mut mutagenesis, which would be something like a cancer causing problem. The residual stuff is just degraded by normal cellular processes. You can dial in and fine tune the immunogenicity of, the of these uh, vaccines and also their response to the emergence of mutations. And we'll talk about that in a second. It's a very efficient way to deliver material into uh, human cells. Again, it can be used for cancer chemotherapy and so forth. There's really minimal amounts of side effects because of the vector itself. It's, it's easy to make it, it's inexpensive, and you can make a lot of it quickly. And that's a very important thing during a pandemic like this. Um, the disadvantages are, are it's never been tested on a large scale, but we're doing it now. Over 30 million people right now in the United States have received either one of these vaccines, and we're seeing very, very few side effects. I will talk about those in a second. There could be some things down the road, maybe, possibly, that were, we would, that were unexpected, but I will tell you that vaccines are one of the safest things that we do in medicine. We give people all kinds of medications, blood thinners and diabetic medications and antibiotics that are dangerous to give to patients that have a lot of side effects. It's very, very, very rare that someone has a severe reaction to a vaccine or has a long-term reaction to a vaccine. Um, these vaccines have been used in other viruses uh, for Zika and um, also for uh, Ebola and HIV. It did seem to work for Zika, but the Zika pandemic sort of fizzled out. HIV is a very complicated virus with lots of other problems, and Ebola, this platform didn't work very well. One of the questions we still don't know, however, is how long you will remain immune to um, with these vaccines. Here's the Pfizer vaccine. Both of these vaccines, as, are the, as is the AstraZeneca vaccine, are two shots. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is one shot. Um, you have a prime shot. Three weeks later, you have a booster with Pfizer. For Moderna, you have a prime shot, and you, then you get your booster four weeks later. One of the big questions is, well, what happens if I don't get that second shot? Probably you still have quite a bit of immunity from the first shot. In England, they are currently not boosting people because they want to get as many people vaccinated right off the bat as possible. Uh, the Biden administration has, I think, wisely wanted to keep to the um, criteria for these vaccines and is recommending a second shot. That little booster really ramps up your response, and I'll show you that in a second. But there's a little bit of flexibility about when you give that. It can be done, easily be done a week or two uh, around the date of your second vaccine. It might even be able to be done a, a month later. There's actually some data with the AstraZeneca vaccine now that it seems to be better to boost them 12 weeks after they've had their prime. But So I think that this is going to be a little bit of a moving target, so to speak. Uh, but uh, it is an important thing to try to keep within the parameters of what was designed. These are the two studies. They were very large studies, 43,000 people in Pfizer, 30,000 people in Moderna. In the background of a lot of COVID disease, um, only eight cases of COVID occurred in people who were vaccinated. There were 162 cases of COVID in people who had received the placebo. That gives you an efficacy of about 95%. None of the people who received the vaccine had severe disease or required hospitalization. Almost identical, it's really strange how it's almost identical data for the Moderna vaccine. So very, very similar results, which really add to the robustness of this data. This is the graph that shows these are the people that got COVID that were had received the placebo. Here's the people that received the vaccine, very, very little uh, COVID disease. Antibody response was very good, especially um, at the, after the second dose, better, frankly, than natural infection. And that's why we recommend that individuals who have had COVID-19 still get vaccinated about 90 days after they've had their infection because that produces the, the vaccines produce much more immunity. Here's just a little my, one of my graphs, and here's the first vaccine with the Pfizer vaccine. Eight days later, um, you have quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of uh, robust uh, response uh, just before you get your second vaccine. 65 to 80 percent of neutralizing antibodies, so that may be good enough if you happen to miss your second shot. But if you get that booster, whammo, you go up to about 90 to 100, and that's even better than natural infection. So very very effective vaccines. This just shows the cellular response, the T cells and B cells, which are a very important part for lasting immunity. And both of these vaccines, as have the other vaccines, have shown a very, very good response with maintaining that kind of uh, uh, immunogenicity. Some of the side effects, lots of people are worried about these vaccines. So the mRNA vaccines, because they stimulate your immune system, especially after the second vaccine, it's very common for people to have some pretty unpleasant side effects. That includes a very sore arm, Maybe a fever, sometimes a high, as high as 101, 102, flu-like symptoms, achy bones, kind of joint pain, occasionally some kind of weird things like swollen lymph nodes. 
that's your immune res uh, system responding to that second dose. Some of these symptoms can occur after the first dose. I will tell you, I had the Pfizer vaccine. I had nothing after the first dose, except for a little bit of a sore arm. The second dose felt kind of yucky for about 12, to 20, about 12 to 18 hours, but then felt great after that. Um, so none of these things are life-threatening and they really are common. Uh, so don't worry about them if you have some symptoms. I, I will tell you, since this crowd is a little bit more senior, that these, this seems to occur much more commonly in younger people. They have younger immune systems. Those of us in the over 60 crowd, uh, we've got a few um, rickets in our immune system. So there are a few reports of severe anaphylaxis, very, very rare, uh, but it does happen if you have a penicillin allergy or a shellfish allergy, you need to tell the vaccine clinic that you do have those allergies. I will tell you for drug allergies like penicillin, sulfa, those sort of things, that's unusual for that to overlap with anaphylaxis. If you've had anaphylaxis, you really need to tell uh, the vaccine clinic before you get vaccinated because they will maybe give you a little bit of Benadryl. They will also keep you there for 45 minutes. As Judith knows, we keep people there for 15 minutes regardless uh, to watch to make sure they're not having a reaction. But anaphylaxis is very, very uncommon. Uh, so it should, and we know that COVID-19 is a bad disease and it kills people. So the risk and benefit, I think, of the vaccine, the benefit certainly outweighs the risk. I'm going to let Judith talk about this because she's going to talk about who's getting vaccinated when. It's a touchy topic, but a very important one. Bottom line is, is that everybody's probably going to have access to a vaccine in the next several months, and hopefully we'll get a large portion of the United States vaccinated by the end of the spring, early summer. Special considerations, we do think that women uh, that are high risk for acquiring COVID, let's say they're an ICU nurse who are pregnant, should go ahead and get the vaccine. The American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends not withholding the vaccine in high risk individuals. People who have compromised immune systems, they should get the vaccine. Chemo cancer patients, people who are receiving immunologic agents for, their, for arthritis, HIV positive patients should all receive the vaccine. It's a, a non-live vaccine, so it's very, very safe. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna are both doing trials in children now down to age six, uh, and it appears to be quite safe, and that's going to be an important data that's going to come out in the next month or, or so. People with underlying neurologic diseases, again, um, Guillain-Barre, multiple sclerosis, ALS, the risk of acquiring COVID and getting really sick with COVID in those situations is quite high, so I still would favor probably vaccinating, but we have to think about that, and then we talked about the anaphylaxis thing. Well, what does it mean to be vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2? Because I think this is a little bit confusing. It means that your immune system is going to recognize the virus as a pathogen, as non-self, and it's going to uh, elicit a neutralizing antibody response and activate your cellular immune system that will most likely confer immunity for you to the disease. Because of that, you're significantly less likely to develop severe disease requiring hospitalization and you will be significantly less likely to die from COVID-19. Does that mean that you won't get COVID-19? No, it's unlikely that you will get COVID-19 if you've been vaccinated, but it is not zero. People who get vaccinated for influenza can still get the flu, uh, but it often is a much less serious disease. And our ultimate goal is to keep people out of the hospital and to protect them from dying from this disease. We don't know whether at this point, whether you will be less likely to spread SARS-CoV-2. And for that reason, we want you to continue uh, to wear uh, a mask until we have that data. I think it's likely that you won't be as transmissible, but we don't know for sure. How long will the vaccine last? We don't know yet. Hopefully it'll last more than six to eight months. It may be something like influenza that we have to do yearly boosters. We just don't know. Uh, this may dictate what we do with that. Um, we are beginning to see uh, the emergence of mutations and these so-called variants. It's normal for viruses, especially coronaviruses, to mutate uh, uh, and every time they replicate, they make mistakes and they may find a mutation that's actually selective and more makes it more robust. This has happened with one in England, the 117 mutation, uh, which is now circulating in the United States. It does appear that the vaccines cover that one pretty well. We're a little concerned about the South Africa 1351 back, uh, variant. We're watching that very carefully. All of these variants affect the affinity of the SARS-CoV virus to attach to the, T, uh, to the uh, ACE2 receptor sites. So these certainly are more infectious variants and perhaps they might be more virulent, they might be more dangerous. Um, but the vaccines do seem to show at least, at the very least, 50 to 60% coverage, even for some of the nastiest players here. And so that's good news. The faster we vaccinate people and get this virus under control, the less likely that they're going to mutate. Dr. Fauci said this last week, you know, viruses don't mutate if they can't replicate. 
And that's what we got to do. We've got to get as many people vaccinated as fast as possible to achieve herd immunity, which is going to be about 75% of the population. We've got to get the whole world vaccinated because the bottom line is if you have pockets of ongoing infection with SARS-CoV-2, you're going to have the emergence of mutations that may become resistant to the vaccine. So there really is an important part of trying to make sure that everybody in the planet has access to a good vaccine. COVAX is started by, has been started by the World Health Organization. It's going to be a central distributing, a distributing center for vaccines for underdeveloped and underserved countries uh, and will be the way of getting vaccines out to the people who perhaps um, had the least resources. So vaccines are going to be part of our journey, but they won't uh, of controlling COVID-19, but they're not going to be uh, the sole answer. Uh, and I do hope that the legacy of all those individuals that we've lost over the last several months, which has been horrific, I, I personally experienced it at Huntington Hospital, that what we've learned from this, that truth and science and equity really are the most important parameters in guiding our, our work with this particular pathogen. And that next time, and I'm sorry to say there probably will be a next pandemic, we can and must do better. So I'd like to thank all of you and I'm gonna turn it over to Judith. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Kimberly Schreiner. So I'm going to remove your spotlight there and uh, go ahead and spotlight Judith. Uh, let's see, there you are. Whoops, am I, yeah. And um, I also just wanted to uh, quickly introduce uh, Judith Dunaway, who is the representative here from the Pasadena Department of Health. So thank you so much for joining us. And just to, uh, for the introduction, um, the, <laughs> so um, Pasadena, Public, uh, Pasadena Public Health Department since 19, excuse me, 1892, the Pasadena Public Health Department has been responsible for helping protect, maintain, and improve the health of the Pasadena community. The city of Pasadena is one of only three cities in the state of California that maintains its own independent local health jurisdiction with responsibility for a wide variety of services that support three core public health functions of assessment, policy development, and assurance. So thank you so much for joining us, Judith. Take it away. Wonderful, thank you, Annie, I appreciate it. Um, hi everyone, I'm Judith Dunaway. I'm the Health Promotion and Policy Development Division Manager for the Pasadena Public Health Department. I am happy to be here and share some information about uh, our department and our efforts and our role in vaccination. So as Annie mentioned, the Pasadena Health Department has been around since 1892. And um, we are one of three city health jurisdictions in the state. There's 58 county health jurisdictions for a total of 61. And even though we are a city health department, we are not um, a small health department. Um, we don't have a small jurisdiction, um, um, a medium size. More likely we're about in the middle of the 61. We are uh, fully accredited and we're one of the few uh, first in the state to become fully accredited. And we have full service uh, programs funded federally, locally, and by the state. Uh, we, uh, a couple of years ago, we engaged in the, a new strategic um, um, process for um, a strategic plan. And we uh, developed or came up with these uh, North Stars, these five North Stars that guide a lot of our work. Uh, it was a very long and extensive process, but very fruitful and very uh, important in, in communicating the things that matter to us. And in this conversation of vaccine um, administration and vaccines in general, we are focusing our efforts on equity, meeting people where they are, and really coming together and sharing information with our partners, with our community, and other folks um, that want to um, participate in this effort. So what is the role of the health department with the vaccinations? We, um, the health departments are throughout the state are allocated uh, vaccines from, um, from the state coming to the health department. And when it, when it comes, when the allocation is, um, um, provided to the health department, the health department in, in our case and in many other jurisdictions case, cases, are there's a, a portion of that that is provided to our partners, such as in our case, we um, gave some to Huntington Hospital, uh, pharmacies, some providers and, and other providers. And the initial questions, as you all can imagine, in the phases and who was coming first was, 
uh, what, where do I go or how do I become, how do I get my vaccine? And um, we've been telling folks and it's on our website and, and we still wanna promote this information. Uh, we want folks to really uh, ask their medical provider uh, for that opportunity and uh, if they're healthcare workers, their employer. And the reason that we want that is because that we want to make sure people have a medical home, but also because that is a more sustainable option, as you know, and I'll share in a minute. Um, as I said, the allocation, some of it went to our partners. And in this next slide, you can see what the health department did with our allocation. I'll share with your vaccination dashboard in a second as well, so you can see how much vaccine has been ordered and what that allocation looks like with our partners and the one that we kept uh, in-house. So the, the, uh, the doses that we have um, kept at the health department had been um, the, administered at, in three different ways. So we've done closed clinics on-site and off-site, such as with fire department or PD or police department. We've also uh, deployed strike teams composed of public health department staff that uh, go have gone to long-term care facilities that are not serviced by the pharmacy program. And we have also conducted uh, and um, continue to conduct um, mass uh, medical point of dispensing. So MPOX is um, we, where we've done up to about a thousand vaccinations per day. So those are the three ways that the health department uses or some of our allocation that we keep. Uh, on our dashboard, you can see that to date, and this is updated every Tuesday, we have ordered 26,000 vaccines, uh, 775. We are in, in phase 1B tier 1. Um, when that changes, that information will be updated on our website as well. From the 26,000 vaccines that have been ordered, um, you can see that um, 17,675 have been given to our, uh, our partners. Um, there's 22 uh, providers that have been approved and there's a process for becoming approved and getting registered. Uh, those folks not only have to um, report the information to the immunization registry, so they, they have to go through a process. So from the 26,775, 17,675 were allocated to, our, uh, to providers. The remaining 9,100 um, uh, were kept at the health department and distributed in the three ways that I just shared. Uh, to date, we have administered 6,898. Um, and we're, we have scheduled clinics. We had one yesterday, we had one um, today, and then we're having some next week. So this, um, the 9100 um, is uh, uh, being reduced as we're doing the, the distributions and the vaccinations. And every week we get an allotment um, and we're hoping that we, it continues to increase. As you know, the Pasadena population is about 140,000. So we have, we have a long way to go. And, and this is one of the reasons why the priority T populations are the way that they are. Um, on the left side, uh, bottom part of your screen, you can see that we have um, vaccinated 19,861 Pasadena residents and um, 23, uh, with one dose, I'm sorry, 23,318 with um, some of that includes uh, second dose. And I apologize. I'm there we go. Um, so who are we vaccinating now? Who is on that tier? So you have uh, more, more uh, most familiar with, uh, we started with healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents and staff. And then we added uh, seniors over age 65 plus. So that is where we currently are. We are collecting data um, every day on where we are with these allocations, where we are with the population. We have about 22,000 seniors in Pasadena uh, over age 65. We have about 50% uh, of those folks, about 10,000 emails, and we are making sure that, you know, about 3,000 of them are in long-term care facilities. So we're going through that number to make sure. I saw a few, a few people in the chat ask this question about um, equity and how are we making sure we're reaching the, the hardest to reach population. So we appreciate that question and we're working really hard to make sure that we're not missing anybody. We do have some hard to reach um, seniors on several of the city's list, um, many of them from parks and recreation because they have either been registered for a class or part of a, a community center. So we have, um, for folks that don't have access to the internet, we've made phone calls. We do have our citizen service center phone number available as well that can help folks navigate and register for an appointment if they don't have access to, to the internet. So we, we have a variety of ways to do that. Uh, as, as you can see on the graphics here, there's some options for folks um, 
to get vaccinated and we're increasing that we're, we're trying to uh, we're working with Huntington Hospital right now for uh, having some pop up sites and um, and then as you may have heard some other folks are doing their own vaccinations like uh, PUSD is going to be vaccinating their own um, they started as, uh, to vaccinate their teachers and staff. Uh, so we're looking at all the options um, and especially as we move down the phases and tiers. So um, it's important and Dr. Schreiner mentioned this that you know that there is the first dose and then there's your second dose. We we want to make sure that folks continue to follow some some prevention measures even after they get vaccinated, including covering their nose and mouth with a mask, um, stay, staying six feet away from people that you don't live with, um, avoiding gatherings, um, continue washing hands and getting disinfected, uh, disinfecting surfaces. And oh, the this, the federal government came up also with a, a V-safe um, um, tool for folks to enroll and track their symptoms to make sure that we are aware of what what is coming, what's happening. So this is uh, it, this is one of the safety measures that continues to monitor the, um, folks' health. Um, during um, and after vaccination. And even in our own MPODs, as, as Dr. Schreiner mentioned, we're, we're watching people. There's an observation period built into the vaccination. Um, it's about 15 minutes, but longer if needed, but 15 minutes minimum. And from beginning to end, most people on um, average, we're getting people in and out in about 35 to 45 minutes. Um, so we're tracking every single thing at our MPODs, uh, the vaccination clinics, to uh, make sure that um, people have a, a good experience and that it's uh, anything that we're not taking into account that we take a look at that for future clinics. Um, I already shared this one. Oh, it's going backwards. I apologize. And here are some resources that we have on our website. Uh, we also, uh, we obviously we have our own website. We have the CDC link and we have this, the state of California has a vaccinate all 58. Um, in addition to this, I wanted to share that we started an outreach team, an outreach um, stakeholder group uh, maybe three weeks ago. And Dr. Schreiner was kind enough to, to uh, co-host a presentation along with our epidemiologist, Dr. Matt Feaster. And that was our initial um, training for this group of stakeholders. We met again this Wednesday and we are conducting an assessment of everybody in the, there's about 32 um, partners on their community-based organizations, institutions, et cetera. And our goal is to develop tools and distribute them to um, Pasadena residents in a variety of ways, print, social media, um, videos, whatever is, is needed, and uh, we're getting that information through the assessment to make sure that anybody that needs the information to make this very important decision has the information that they need. Um, so that, inf that is coming. We have a town hall this Tuesday with uh, um, Dr. Hayes, uh, Dr. Um, Schreiner, and um, Dr. Barnes from Caltech and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hayes and Dr. Schreiner from Huntington Hospital. And it's for, it's one of our uh, many events for Black History Month to, and this particular uh, town hall on Tuesday is to uh, address vaccination concerns, hesitation. Um, we realize that uh, there are many concerns in our communities of color. So we wanna make sure that for African-American folks that have hesitation with vaccines that they receive information uh, and that they are aware that, and that, that we acknowledge that having questions and concerns is a very valid part of the process and that we wanna provide the information that folks need. So. With that, I uh, will provide my information. Um, Ani mentioned that will be shared with you all after the meeting, and I'm happy to um, answer questions after this portion. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And thank you so much for having me here today. Hey, well, thank you so much, uh, Judith, for, uh, for being here and for that. I'm now going to uh, add uh, the rest of them to the, whoops, and I just lost Dr. Schreiner. So, uh, let's see there, add spotlight. Okay, so now we have uh, Dr. Schreiner and Judith Dunaway, and uh, then uh, Katie will be, uh, um, Katie Brandon will be moderating. So she's been reading all of those amazing questions. Um, just to let you know that uh, we're running a little behind. So we will do a full 30 minutes of questions. So we'll be running till about uh, 1220 or so. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kimberly and Judith for uh, sticking with us. This is a huge topic and uh, really appreciate it. Take it away, Katie. 
Thank you so much, Annie. And, and thanks again, Judith and Dr. Schreiner. We've gotten some great comments and a lot of questions. So I'll just get jump right in. Um, so with uh, the more tiers being eligible, uh, will those who are 65 and older retain their priority in getting the vaccines? Judith, I think this would be best directed back to you. That's a wonderful question. Um, we understand that sometimes it, we, we don't have enough vaccine. That is something that most people are aware of. The supply is just not coming in the amounts that we, we, we wish it did. And this is not just exclusive to Pasadena. This is um, across the state and throughout the, the, the nation. So, um, but we are prioritizing those groups. We One of the, um, I guess, telltale signs that we're seeing is that the more outreach we're doing, the more phone calls we're placing, not only through those lists that we have in those emails, uh, we're seeing um, less coming back to us, meaning that um, initially we saw a huge response and we couldn't fill the, um, we didn't have enough spots filled that, fill, uh, available, but we're seeing that the more um, calls that we're making, the, the less um, requests that we're getting. So that's not to say that we're, that we vaccinated everybody. We're trying to get data to make sure that we know um, you know, these are the many, these are the 22,000 eligible, this many have gotten it, and, and people will maintain their priority throughout the process. And we do know that as other uh, phases and tiers keep added, keep getting added, every, the eligibility pool will just increase, but that doesn't, that will not um, remove anybody from, the, from their spot. Thank you, Judith. And just as a follow-up, what would you say to someone who says, I just want to get my vaccine now, and I'm 65 and older, where should they start? They should start with an inquiry form first with their provider, and the, and then if their provider says I don't have any yet, I'm not registered yet, um, I'm not sure when it's coming to me, um, then they can try our website and submit in an inquiry form. We get back to every single person that submits an inquiry form on our website. If they cannot get through our website or they haven't gotten a call back, they can call the Citizen Service Center. I'll put that number on the chat. In that, in the Citizen Service Center staff uh, can assist them in uh, getting information and possibly even registering as well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schreiner, I think this one is for you. So after getting my vaccine, can I safely get together with others who have also gotten both doses? So that's the question. Getting a vaccine does not mean that you can take your mask off and roll around in COVID. Um, and so what we're concerned about is that, uh, that even if you're vaccinated, you might still be able to carry the vaccine. And remember that not everybody, especially older people, respond really well to vaccines. Sometimes they may have a slightly diminished response. And so it's important that you continue to be careful. If it's your immediate family and everybody's vaccinated, then you can begin to form sort of a vaccine pod, if you will, where um, you have a small group of people that you feel comfortable with. But I would still keep unmasked times with people to a, li a limitation. I don't, um, don't spend a lot of hours in closed spaces with people, even if they've been vaccinated, because it's, there's a possibility that they could still transmit virus. And of course, with the emergence of the variants, we're gonna watch this very carefully. We don't wanna have to start all over again with this fiasco. So I think it's important that we try to uh, be cautious, uh, but you can begin to, um, if you can form a little vaccine pod, begin to some of your uh, activities with close family members or people that you know are well vaccinated and also are likely to be not infectious. Thank you. I have another one for you. Um, so please address the questions people are asking about taking other me medications before or after having the vaccine. In particular, they're asking about Benadryl and Tylenol. So it's very likely that those aren't going to interfere too much with your response to the vaccine. Um, your immune system is pretty smart and it knows that it's got to do something if a foreign pathogen has arrived on, on site there. Um, we recommend if, you, if there's no reason for you to take a Benadryl, Tylenol, or Advil, or you know, a non-steroidal agent, before you go to have your vaccine, then don't do it. Just you want to be kind of primed and ready to go. You know, if you, take a, uh, if you get a, feel a little punk after the first vaccine or a lot punk after the second vaccine, then Tylenol is a better choice just because it's a little less effective on the, has a little bit of a less effect on the immune system. Uh, but the truth is, is that I think that those kind of medications in small amounts are not going to impact your response to the vaccine that much. So if you take those medicines for another reason, uh, and you really, they're an important part of your medical treatment, then you know, I wouldn't uh, skip them, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schreiner. Judith, um, we're getting a question. Why are infections in communities of color more prevalent? And I know this could be a whole nother topic, but maybe you could 
give us a short answer to that one. Thank you for the question. Uh, absolutely. So we do know that um, our essential workers that are out and about going to work and in food service industries and a variety of other industries are hardest hit and um, in that and they continue to be exposed. So um, that is something that we are very aware of. And that is why one of the reasons why they were added to that priority list. We haven't gotten to most uh, essential workers outside of healthcare at this point, but they are um, on the next, uh, they are really next on our list and we're working on communications and strategies to make sure that we uh, make it very simple for them to, to, to get on the list. Again, the limiting factor here is the vaccine, the, the supply, but we are hoping that when it starts coming in in higher amounts uh, or when and if, that we have that communication available and that we are, uh, are making our concerted um, uh, efforts to outreach to that population because we do know that some of that hesitation is higher in, in those groups. Thank you, thank you. And maybe as a follow-up, we had some questions about hesitation. Is there something that you would, either of you would recommend telling to someone who's worried about vaccinated, maybe they've never gotten the flu shot? So I can take that. You know, I, I, I understand uh, everybody's concern about this because it's happened. This is a brand new pathogen and it's a brand new set of vaccines and it's all happening very fast. It's kind of swirling around us. But I do think that by everybody is aware of just what a catastrophe this pandemic has been. Um, you know, we've just had an enormous amount of death and uh, sickness in the country. This is a very, very serious uh, virus. It's much more serious, much more infectious than influenza. And vaccines have a long track record of being very safe. So again, it's this risk benefit uh, balance that we have to assume. This is a very bad disease with a very high morb morbidity and mortality, especially in people who are older, uh, especially people who are older. I will speak from that from personal experience at the hospital. Uh, and so the, the risk of, this vac of these vaccines, which is very small, uh, certainly outweighs uh, or is outweighed by the enormous benefit that this vaccine will provide to protect people from becoming so sick that they have to be hospitalized and perhaps most importantly from dying from COVID-19. So I understand people's hesitancy. Look at the data, look at good data, look at the CDC, listen to Dr. Fauci, uh, listen to what the Biden administration is doing now in terms of trying to be transparent about this. We want to recognize if there's problems with the vaccines. We're looking at every kind of event that happens but these are large studies with 30,000, 40,000 people, 30 million people have been vaccinated so far and really with very, very few uh, reactions that are uh, significant. So I would strongly encourage people, this is going to save your life, get this vaccine. I suppose this is another follow-up. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about people with allergies to shellfish, those with autoimmune uh, illnesses, um, so what advice do you have for them? So it is concerning. Um, I will tell you that true anaphylaxis um, is rare. Uh, individuals who do have severe shellfish allergy uh, that have problems breathing or uh, marked swelling, they need to talk about the vaccine with their provider, uh, with their primary care doctor, and also alert the vaccine clinic uh, that they have that problem. Uh, Pre-medicating those individuals with a little bit of Benadryl might be a good idea. Uh, watching them certainly afterwards uh, for very severe reaction is important. That's why we'll watch you for about 45 minutes. And this has been looked at uh, in the last um, couple of weeks. Data has come out for both the vaccines of the millions of doses of Pfizer and Moderna that have been given right now. Less than 1% less than of people have had a severe, probably even less than 0.01% because there's only about four, 11 cases in Pfizer and, and six in Moderna that had true anaphylaxis. None of those people died. Uh, some of them did require hospitalization. Um, and so it's something we wanna pay attention to, alert the vaccination clinic, alert your provider, talk about it before you have your vaccine. Uh, but I do think that it's important that you, know, that you get the vaccine because if you get COVID, there's a very good likelihood you're gonna have a bad outcome. Thank you, that's very clear. Um, okay, we have a question um, from Jackie. Are there particular vaccines that are more effective with certain blood types? That's for me? I, yes. Oh, okay, so we know that there seems to be some sort of correlation with uh, bad outcome in COVID and blood types, although that's a little bit murky still. That may not true, turn out to be too true, but we're sort of looking at that. There are no data to suggest that people of different blood types are going to respond differently to the vaccines. That's not something that's very likely. 
uh, that's never been shown in, in the long history of using vaccines in the past. I don't think it's going to be relevant for this group of vaccinations. And so it uh, doesn't matter what your blood type is, get the vaccine. Thank you. Um, so please, uh, this, this is a good question we've got. Um, so is it all right to switch between the types of vaccines, such as getting the first dose of Moderna and the second dose of Pfizer? No, that's a good question. And these vaccines are very, very similar. I mean, it's astounding how similar they are in terms of the results. And so it might be okay. Um, but right now we wanna try to stick to science. It's important as, as more of the general public is getting vaccinated, that data, somebody I noticed in the chat had said they were enrolled in the CDC site, good for you and for contributing to science. Uh, that data is being looked at and followed. And so it's probably better to try to stick to the same vaccine that you were given initially but if we have to, if for some reason there's some major manufacturing catastrophe with one of the others, I think it's probably going to prove, out, prove to be safe. That would be very easy to study uh, over a very short period of time, and it is being looked at. So um, it can be done. The, the timing of this, as I said, in England, they've noted for some reason that 12 weeks after the first shot, the AstraZeneca vaccine may be more likely to produce an even better immune response. So we're, we're kind of getting our, getting our mojo, if you will, with how to, how to use these vaccines. But uh, I don't think it would be a catastrophe if you got a, a second different one. I wouldn't recommend it, but it wouldn't be a problem, I don't think. Thank you. Um, Judith, I'm going to address this one to you, but it, it is to do with LA County, um, but maybe, maybe it rolls over. Um, they're talking about scheduling appointments and having to use a smartphone to get an authorization code. This was in particular to do with scheduling it through LA County. Um, so what would you suggest for someone who's having trouble um, with access? With the, uh, so there are, if you're a Pasadena resident, we are, um, we do have our inquiry form online. We do have, um, for folks that are eligible, they're getting uh, registration information. Um, for LA County, I can't speak for their process. I, I except from what I've heard and what I, we we know from we've heard directly from LA County telling us, as well as from folks that have tried that process. Uh, it, I there's some someone told me, oh well, if I went on this day, there was a ton of availability, but then within two hours it was it was full. So um, they're increasing um, sites. Um, so uh, to keep trying and find a variety of ways, I know that it's not an easy process, particularly given the fact that week to week, the doses are changing about how, how much we're getting. So um, please continue to, um, to try. I know that it's, it, that it's, it's not a, a fun process to, to keep waiting and, and not have luck when, when you really wanna get this done. Um, uh, continue exhausting the, the resources and uh, using their website. Sometimes they do have a number, uh, like we've gotten better and we're, we're, not, we're nowhere where we wanna be yet, but when we added the inquiry form, that helped when we offer the phone number that helped uh, when we had our, our FAQs um, calls to our not only to the health department um, call center but to the city's call center decreased so many times it's those those questions that people have and if we address them then they're less likely to feel um, really abandoned I know that I know how how lonely that can feel to to want this information and not have it so please let us know how we can help Thank you. And just to reiterate what Annie said earlier, everyone who's registered for this um, session today will get a follow-up email. Links to many different resources in both the Senior Center and Pasadena Village have, have uh, info pages that include uh, phone numbers to get to LA County. So if you don't know how to um, call LA County or Pasadena Health Department, which is really easy through the Citizen Service Center, that, that information is out there and we're happy to help. Okay, a question um, again for Judith. Um, so can you uh, reiterate what you said about if, if someone has had COVID, how long should they wait? Should they wait 90 days from the last symptoms or from the first symptoms they had before getting vaccinated? I think Dr. Schreiner can answer this better, but in our experience, we uh, because of the, it's rare to be reinfected within 90 days, but um, we are, that's one of the reasons that the after first vaccination, if they do, um, if they, I'm sorry, the question was, how soon to get the second vaccine? Um, no, so if someone has actually had the disease, um, uh, you know, they should be waiting 90 days from what? The first symptoms they had or the last symptoms they had? I think it's a specific question. Okay, well, so we've been, oh, go ahead, Dr. Shiner. Yeah, so that, so it's a little, you know, flexible. 
um, in fact, some there are some folks now that are beginning to think that that's a little bit too long. But uh, bottom line is, is that when you've recovered from the, uh, when you feel sort of semi back to normal, uh, I would wait 90 days from that. If you wait 90 days from when you first had your symptoms, you're probably still fine. Um, I will tell you that if you've had COVID before, there's no need to test to see if you've been exposed. Somebody asked that question, it's a good question. Uh, but you don't need to get tested before you go get your vaccine to see if you've been exposed. But if you had COVID, you might have a little more ro robust response to the vaccine because again, your immune system goes, oh, I know what this is and I'm gonna act up here a little bit. So uh, that's pretty normal. Uh, somebody asked a very interesting question uh, who, uh, whose mother survived the 1918 pandemic and whether she would have some immunity. Uh, remember, these are very different viruses. The 1918 pandemic was a, an influenza virus. It's completely different from a coronavirus. But it does bring up the um, important recognition that uh, even if you've had other coronaviruses, most of us have had a cold sometime in our lives, that probably doesn't confer, does not confer any immunity to this virus. This is a brand new beta coronavirus. It's completely different. And that's why it's just such a nasty player. Thanks for addressing that one too. Um, Judith, there's some questions about the inquiry form on the Pasadena Public Health Department site. Um, so if people have filled it out, they're saying, should we fill it out every week or is once enough? Can you, uh, can you talk to us about the process about them getting contacted after it's filled out? Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, one time is sufficient. Uh, if you don't get... Uh, um, if you don't get contacted and that is the concern, uh, you're welcome to fill it out again. They're keeping track of who's where it's coming in and who they're um, reaching out to. There might be uh, an issue with uh, not receiving that, con that contact when you're getting, I don't know if, um, if it's a callback or an email or both, but I know they're making multiple attempts. So one time is, is enough. There is another question that I saw about this, why I call the Citizen Service Center versus the Health Department. The Citizen Service Center is assisting us with um, fielding calls because the Health Department staff are activated at the MPOPs. Um, they're activated in a variety of different ways. So our, our call center um, capacity has been uh, drastically decreased. So we are very grateful that the Citizen Service Center is helping our department. Thank you, Judith. Um, okay, um, going back to autoimmune diseases, we're getting questions about if uh, getting the vaccine could heighten the symptoms of their autoimmune uh, disease. Would uh, be. I know what you're going to ask. I, I can answer that. I, I hope you read that one. I'm, I'm sorry, I, just, I didn't. I did you a disservice in reading no, the question. No, no, no. I I know what I know what they're asking. So it is a concern, you know, when you have when you're you already have some sort of inflammatory disease, rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia or um, ulcerative colitis or something like that, could the vaccines exacerbate that? The answer is no. Um, and it doesn't seem to happen. We haven't had a report of people with lots of people. I said 30 million people have been uh, vaccinated now. Some of them have autoimmune diseases. People with autoimmune diseases often are taking immunosuppressive drugs. And so they are at high risk for having a bad outcome if they get COVID. Uh, so the vaccines really are very safe. They don't seem to elicit an exacerbation of things like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or fibromyalgia. Um, and there probably isn't much difference between the vaccines. Adenovirus-based vaccines sometimes can be a little bit more problematic because we all have had an adenovirus sometime in our life. And so that type of vaccine, that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, in particular, could be perhaps a little more likely to maybe give you a few more achy bones than the mRNA vaccines. But the mRNA vaccines are very, very safe. And they don't, as I said in, during the lecture, they really don't interfere in your own uh, body processes. They just teach your immune system how to recognize the spike protein. So when you encounter the real deal, it knows what to do. I hope that answered the question. Get the Thank vaccine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know we've addressed this in part, but I'll read out the question. After I've received my two doses, will I be able to take public transportation while still wearing a mask and being socially distanced as possible? So, you know, going to the grocery store, taking public transportation um, are riskier right now because we have a lot of disease in the community. I know Judith can, you know, her folks can speak to still how high a density of COVID we have in Pasadena and certainly in LA County. You know, we're kind of coming down off the big surge and so everybody's feeling a little bit optimistic, but I will tell you, it just still is very much, much higher than anything we've experienced through the whole pandemic yet. So there's a lot of disease out there. The likelihood that you could encounter a variant or a more mutational virus 
uh, is possible that you know they maybe the vaccine that you've received isn't quite so spiffy to control that. We think that these vaccines currently will cover most of them. So I would say you have a little less risk now in doing those activities, but you still have to wear probably, if you're just gonna wear a cloth mask, you should probably wear two cloth masks. You should wear a high quality mask when you're out and about uh, in areas where you're likely to encounter the virus. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions about in, um, upcoming surgeries. So, um, you know, if they're having surgery soon, should they get the first vaccine, even though they know they won't be able to get the sec second vaccine on the schedule as prescribed, or should they wait until after their um, surgery that's coming up? That's kind of a, a tricky question because we don't want to um, uh, uh, we don't want to cause problems that we, with uh, maybe a small reaction to the vaccine is going to be confused with the reaction to the surgery. Uh, so if this, it sort of depends on what the surgery is. I, I had a patient last week that was an important question. He'd had a head trauma and um, he was due for his second vaccine. And we decided to delay it because in those patients, if they develop a high fever, we don't, well, we worry about a meningitis. And so it sort of depends a little bit on the surgery. If you can kind of toggle your vaccines around the surgery, maybe get it either well before your surgery is scheduled or, you know, at least a couple weeks after you've really recovered from your surgery, that's probably better. Um, but if it looks like that's not going to work for you, then I would discuss it with your doctor. They probably call me uh, and we can talk about it, but um, it's a little tricky. Uh, again, it's, it's more because, you know, you get a little fever after the vaccine number two. Is that because you're maybe the gallbladder is not completely cleared out of there or you know, you've got a little infection around the surgical site or something, or is that just due to the vaccine? So that we don't want it to muddy the waters too much, but we also want to protect people. So, and we also want them to have a, an immune response that's good. And when you've had immediately post-op, your immune system's maybe a little bit not so revved up as it could be when you're feeling better. Thank you. We're getting a lot of gratitude in the in the chat. So I hope that you both of you get to see that after this. Um, okay, a question about the process. So this question in particular is about Huntington Hospital. If scheduled to get the COVID vaccine at Huntington Hospital, will I also be scheduled for the second shot while I'm there? Maybe even, uh, you know, I know that Dr. Schreiner, you're at Huntington, but maybe Judith, you could also talk about this in, in particular, where you get the first shot and the second shot. Go ahead, Judith. Yeah. Uh, uh, we're, we're usually telling folks to go and get the second vaccine in the same location that they got their first shot. Um, one of the interesting things we're seeing right now is at our uh, second shot clinics is that it's going a lot quicker. And part of that is because people that have gone, done it the first time, there's just the process and the logistics of going through the entire site is just a lot quicker. So uh, we're asking folks to return to the second, to the same location. If for some reason that's not possible to let us know and uh, we can figure that out. Um, but for the most part, that is that is the, the preferred option for a variety of reasons because they have your records there because that you're gonna get your, um, the second appointment would likely come from the place that you went to the first time. And then also for ease of just um, going through the, the clinic, it's just gonna increase, um, increase the likelihood that you'll be in and out even quicker. Thank you. Um, so we have a question. What if you have had mononucleosis and rheumatic fever and fibromyalgia? Rheumatic fever. Thank you. <laughs> get, <laughs> get the vaccine. That, get, just get the vaccine. It's it's you know we're not. There's no evidence again that that the vaccines stir things up in, uh, for people that have underlying autoimmune diseases. And people with underlying autoimmune diseases can have a bad outcome with SARS-CoV-2. So. The benefit of the vaccine far outweighs whatever minimal risk there might be. Get vaccinated. Okay, and then let, let's talk about masks once again. Is it okay to double mask first, non-cloth, and the second cloth? Uh, you know, it, the more the, the more layers you have, the, the more likely that you're going to prevent particles from penetrating. You know, obviously N95s are sort of the gold standard that you know we certainly wear at the hospital. I'm sure Judith's crowd when they're out and about, that's what they wear as well. Those are the highly protective masks. They're very uncomfortable though. I have a, the, a scar on my nose to prove it. So, um, but the, the, the cloth masks are reasonable. And you know, wearing two cloth masks is probably better than one. Wearing three cloth masks, you're gonna stop breathing and pass out and that'll be a whole nother fiasco. So uh, don't do things that are, are going to cause you to have trouble breathing. Uh, a lot of the cloth masks have little pockets where you can purchase some filters. That's not a bad idea. Um, you know, you want a mask that fits pretty tightly to your face, but again, make sure that you can breathe, that you can walk and breathe at the same time. 
Uh, and um, uh, if you have a high quality mask, like let's say a KN95, that's the mask you should wear closest to your face. Don't, wear, don't put that on the outside of the cloth mask, put that on and then put the cloth mask over that. If you have a KN95 and you're not, you know, you're out for, that's my dog walk mask. That's the one I wear when I go out and take my dog out. That's a pretty good mask just for general out and about. If you're gonna dive into uh, the store, you know, grocery stores are kind of dangerous places and I would probably double mask and put the cloth mask on the outside of a KN95. Thank you. Um, so questions about um, those who don't live in Pasadena, but their doctors are here in Pasadena. Judith, you wanna address that one? Uh, yes, so uh, we know that um, healthcare workers were vaccinated in Pasadena regardless of where they lived, they, they worked here. And that we're trying to work with the county to really understand what, what the overlap is, right? So we do have some Pasadena residents that have gotten uh, vaccinated at the county. And, um, and when we are providing this, uh, the vaccinations to the doctors, the, the doctors themselves are, are or the providers are ensuring that they're meeting some criteria, particularly with what, what tier we are in. Um, we do know that um, that's gonna be very difficult. Uh, yesterday we were having this conversation about well, what if you know 75% of my my uh, patients are Pasadena residents, but the rest are not? Uh, how do I manage that? So, we're working closely with the county. Um, we we do know some providers are going to be really strict when it comes to that. We know others are, are not, and and it's it's a hard decision for them because they they are not getting as much vaccine as, as we're hoping that everybody would. Um, so we're working with the county to make sure that it's it's it, it goes kind of both ways, right? That that some of our folks are getting vaccinated on um, by them and and vice versa, but that that maybe they can assist um, the county can assist Pasadena in in getting those those numbers, um, maybe some additional vaccine for that purpose. But when the goal is to get everybody vaccinated, regardless of where they live. So we are not going to limit that, at least on our end. Uh, and we're hoping that everybody will get it and that regardless of where they live with their provider, with their with their clinics, with the pharmacies, through through any of the venues that we have available. Thank you, Judith. Uh, so uh, Katie asked me, like, it's a question about hydroxychloroquine. Um, so hydroxychloroquine is a very old drug, Plaquenil, uh, and it's used, uh, it's a very good treatment for things like rheumatoid arthritis and some autoimmune diseases. It's a relatively safe anti-inflammatory, but it is not completely safe. It has no efficacy and no role to play that has been proven by scientific data in the treatment of COVID-19. There was a lot of controversy about this, of course, several months ago. Uh, the other concern is that hydroxychloroquine, although it is, is a useful drug in people who have serious diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, it is not without its own significant side effects, the most serious of which are cardiac abnormalities, cardiac rhythm problems, especially when it's used in conjunction with other medications, even simple antibiotics like azithromycin, z -pack, or doxycycline. There is no role for hydroxychloroquine in using it for pretreatment to a vaccine or post-treatment to a vaccine to control the side effects of the vaccine. A little bit of Tylenol, maybe an Advil if you're really feeling kind of punky is fine. Hydroxychloroquine is not without risk and especially in older people, it can cause fatal cardiac arrhythmias. And so that's why it's not been shown to have any efficacy and any role to play in the treatment of COVID nor in its use uh, around vaccinations and preventing some of the side effects. Okay, thank you so much. I, I think we are at time and I just wanted to once again thank Annie at the Pasadena Senior Center and the wonderful staff there. Judith and Kimberly, this has just been fantastic and reiterate that an email will be going out and there are links available and the Senior Center and the Village are both here. We want to hear your questions. We know that this is a difficult time and we just want to get as many people vaccinated as possible. So we're so glad to have the partners of the Pasadena Public Health Department and Huntington Hospital and everyone who is working so hard on the front line. So thanks again. And you. I will just add my thanks to all of you, to Katie Brandon and Pasadena Village for uh, helping set this up, uh, Judith, Department of Public Health. And thank you so much, Dr. Kimberly Schreiner. The information is quite amazing. And uh, as we've said several times, it will be available. Um, the, we'll, uh, once we've been able to upload the video to our website, we'll let everybody know and you can watch it over and over again. <laughs> and, and I will just reiterate what uh, Dr. Kimberly and everyone has continued to say, 
get vaccinated. And I know one of your main questions is, I want to, how do I do it? Well, hopefully we helped you there. Um, and just, there will be additional information on websites. Uh, good luck, everyone. Be healthy, mask up, and uh, hopefully we'll all not have to be talking about this this time next year. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, goodbye and uh, be healthy. Cheers. Yeah.